Isaiah 28 today. So grab your Bible, have a read of that, and come back to me and we'll check it out. Isaiah 28 is really rather a disturbing passage in a lot of ways, isn't it? It's this picture of drunk leaders and drunk false prophets, people who are supposed to show Israel the way to live, how to live God's way, but they just jabber meaningless nothings. If you look at your footnotes, you'll probably see that in verse 10 where it says, uh, you know, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there. In Hebrew, it sounds like suz, uh, it sounds like sav la sav, sav la sav, kav la kav, kav la kav, which means, well, it just sounds like meaningless babble, right? So God says in verse 11, then, well, I'll give, give them what they ask for. I'll give them words that mean nothing to them, a foreign language that they can't understand. And he's probably, Isaiah here is probably speaking of the invaders that are going to come and destroy their country. And it's a bit of a, bit of a subnote here, but it's a scary thing that often when God judges someone's sin, this is uh, exactly what he does. He gives a person exactly what they ask for. In other words, God lets the natural consequences of their decisions come about. So as bad as things might get in this world, they're not as bad as they could be. And one of the reasons things aren't as bad even now as they could be is because of God's restraining hand. He's not letting things go the way that they would go if uh, humanity actually had their own way. And that's a bit of a scary thought sometimes, but it's a comforting thought to know that God won't leave us to our own devices all the time too. Anyway, Israel's leaders are trusting in false gods to save them, we see in this passage. They've made, it says, a covenant with the realm for the uh, realm of the dead. Now, I haven't looked up details of what that means, but the problem is that I see that, uh, that they're meant to be in a covenant with God already. They're supposed to trust God, but they're trusting other people or they're trusting some sort of divination or something here to get them through the un, un, <clears throat> the coming onslaught. Well, so we get God's surprising response through the prophet then in verse 16. He says, don't trust your false leaders. Don't trust your false prophets. Don't trust your false gods. Trust in the stone I lay in Zion, he says in verse 16. Whoever trusts in that will never be stricken with panic or put to shame, as it says when it's quoted in the New Testament. We'll get to that in a second. See, he goes on to say, if you trust anything else, it won't hold up. It won't last. Now, as I just said, this verse, verse comes up in 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter makes clear that the cornerstone that Isaiah was talking about here and other passages also make it clear that it's Jesus that he's talking about. He is the cornerstone that if we trust, we will never be put to shame. It also says in context in this passage then that if we trust anything else to rescue us, to save us, in other words, uh, other people might put it, you know, if we make those things our God or our idol, whether it's ourselves, whether it's even a trusted leader or a trusted pastor, whether it's our job, whether it's our finances or whatever else it might be, it will ultimately end in destruction. 